Chapter six is all about networks. Some of the information in the book is a little technical. Main thing here is that you have a really high level understanding of what do we mean when we talk about networks and some of the issues around protocols and other things, how the information is passed safely on. Uh, we'll also take a look into a little bit about the history of the internet. So what exactly is a computer network in its most basic condition? It's just a bunch of computers that can work together. They're completely independent and they share information, data back and forth between themselves. The local area network or a LAN is just that. It's a network of computers that have some sort of a backbone that they're hooked to that allows them to communicate with one another and to a server or to a shared printer. And the key here is the first part of the name, local. So this is typically in the same physical building. Now, when you hear a WAN, a wide area network, as opposed to a local area network, it's just what it sounds like. A wide area network is where the computers that are connected together are not close to one another. They're in the next building over or in the building across town, but they're still all within the same business, the same organization. So it's a, a closed internal network, but when people talk about WANs, they're, you know, typically they're having to go through some sort of fiber optic link to um, cover longer distances. And we'll talk in a later part about why you use fiber optics and why you use copper wires. Enterprise network is just what it means. Anytime you see the word enterprise in business, it means the entire company wide. So in a company, finance may have their own internal land for security reasons. Marketing may have their own, but they're all connected through a corporate backbone that ties them all together. And those different groups, manufacturing is typically maybe in a building that is different than where the administrative offices are, where marketing and accounting is located. We're all in the Portland area used to dealing with broadband internet connection. However, that is not universal around the United States. In fact, one of my former co-workers, good friend of mine, who lives just outside of Wilsonville, does not have access to broadband internet. And certainly as we get into rural parts of the United States, they don't have high speed broadband internet access. And as we discussed in an earlier session, when you get outside of the United States, very few people, except in Western Europe, have access to the internet at all. But one of the previous technologies that was used before the advent of broadband was DSL called Digital Subscriber Line. And it's basically a souped up telephone line and it's offered through the telephone company. In the early days, there was ATM. No, this is not where you get cash out of the, the machine. But it was asynchronous transfer mode was a way of getting faster throughput, higher bandwidth with the limitations of the phone system. As fiber optics started to come into play, they developed a network protocol that's called sonnet. So if you heard that term sonnet, it's referring to the fiber optic network. T carrier system is what the telephone company provides to your uh, business. A T1 line has so much capacity, you can have a half of a T1 line and there's different T1, T2, T3. And it all comes down to how much bandwidth. Originally, it was, you know, how many phone calls do you need to be handling?
but now it's it's really referring to how much data whether it's voice or digital data do you need to be handling as your business and so the phone company will give you a bigger connection depending on what you paid for in order for computers to talk to each other and to share information they have to speak the same language so you hear people talk about ethernet you know i plugged my computer into the ethernet port well ethernet was developed in the early days a couple of protocols called token ring and token bus that was then replaced with the tcp ip and we'll see in the video uh, in class what exactly is tcp ip but the key takeaway here is to understand that's a language that's a protocol that's a format that is used so the data is consistent so that each computer each device can correctly interpret the data that's transmitted one thing to understand when we're in the same physical space and we're talking to each other what your ear is hearing is an analog signal and the key to notice here is in this representation the line is smooth it goes up and down there's no breaks and the distance between each like this is a much long wider distance than this so both the amplitude and the frequency are changing but on a continuous smooth basis that's called analog signal that's what we hear in the real world with our ears, the, the sounds that are produced naturally. Now, when we go to digital systems, you know, you think of digital as an on-off switch. It's either a zero or a one, period. That's the only choice you have. And depending on the speed that you're communicated between the computers, the distance here will always be the same. Now, it could be down at zero, for a period of time, but the spacing on this is always going to be exactly the same, unlike what's up here. <clears throat> the phone company was running out of capacity. Installing additional phone lines around the country is expensive. You know, stringing up copper wire takes money. So as the digital world came in, they started to recognize in any phone conversation that you have, there are periods of silence. As you listen to me speaking, it is not constant sound the entire time. There are brief moments of silence. With the early phone system, that copper wire, it was tied up with my phone call even if both parties were saying absolutely nothing that copper wire was reserved whether it was being used or not so the phone company recognized what if we could take advantage of that silence that dead space and stuff in other conversations other data transmissions and use that piece of copper wire to its maximum capacity and so they developed this concept of, concept of packet switching. And so basically you take whatever the message is, and this, it doesn't matter, it can be voice or data, and you chop it up into little tiny pieces. And in each piece, there's a destination address and a source address contained in that piece of digital data that gets sent out on the wire. And so that wouldn't make any sense for you to hear a conversation of little bits and pieces. So it's transmitted, all broken up into little tiny pieces. It gets to the other end and it gets reassembled into the original message. But the key here is because these are little tiny packets, they don't have to go the same path. If the first packet the fastest way there through the least amount of congestion is one route but when the second packet you know leaves it sees wait a minute there's some network congestion and it can go an alternate path they all get reassembled at the receiving end and you don't know the difference on the receiving end so let's look at a 
just a real brief. Um, well, well, we'll talk more about that in class. Network processing. You'll hear the term client server. And that's really very, the idea there is that you have a server that has the horsepower and the data and the computer that you're using, even though it may be a fully functional computer, it is a client and it's basically just sending a request to the server and then it receives back what it asked for. The difference in the other way is peer-to-peer -peer processing. And the difference here is that each computer in a peer-to-peer -peer network is doing all of the computing. There is no central server to do computing and storing data, but each of the individual computers are doing that. And so another computer can ask them and say, hey, do you have you know, report X, Y, Z? And it says, yes, I've got it, here it is. And so they are sharing the information with each other. Now, it's, and we'll cover more of this in class. One of the interesting things about the internet is how, it, you know, what is actually the internet? And we'll watch a video that goes into that a little bit more, but basically this is what the internet, this image, what the internet is in the United States. When we talk about getting on the internet, we as individuals really are not getting on the internet. We're connecting to a company who sends a message to another company that asks it to be routed on the internet. But the internet backbone in the United States, most people do not connect directly to it. So one of the interesting questions always is, is how old is the internet and who invented it? Well, I'll give you a clue. Al Gore did not invent the internet, even though he famously or infamously uh, in a speech in Congress uh, kind of blurted out that, that he was responsible for the internet. No, as we'll see, he was not. And the video will go into more detail on the internet backbone, but the companies that are on the internet backbone, here's a few of them. And you notice who they are? Sprint, Quest, AT&T, Verizon. What are those companies? Telephone companies. It was the telephone companies that built the backbone of internet in the United States to handle voice calls. Once the voice calls got digitized, they could pack more voice calls onto the same infrastructure and wiring that they had. And so they were really the drivers behind getting this internet backbone set up and functional in the United States. Another term you'll hear talked about sometime is intranet. The difference between internet and intranet is in internet is external, open to the world. Intranet is internal to your organization. Now you can have web pages, websites that look just like they're on the internet, but they only reside within your internal business network. And so they don't exist outside of your organization and that's the intranet. Another thing you'll hear talked about is IP addresses. Originally when IP addresses were set up, the <clears throat> structure of it, it was set up to be 32 bits of information for the IP address. And so here's a typical IP address. Now you can take the 32 bits, and if you remember from an earlier presentation, a bit is just a zero or one. Well, you can translate those into numbers and so the 32 bit of zeros and ones becomes this number of 11 decimal numbers 
represents the same as 32 bits. And so does anyone know what 209.152.46.213, what IP address is that for? Well, here's a thing you can do. Go to the address bar in your browser and type it in just like that. 209 period 152 period 46 period 213. Press enter and see where you go. Now with those 32 bits, you can basically have 8.6 billion individual IP addresses. When the internet was first being set up, 8.6 billion seemed like a big number. But the problem is, the population of the Earth is, you know, 7.4. I haven't checked recently to see if we've exceeded 8 billion. But you can see it's right up, it's close to the number of possible combinations. And the reason that that's a problem is that every device on the internet has to have their own unique address. So if your thermostat, if you have a, a Nest thermostat, that's got its own unique address. Your cell phone, your laptop, your desktop. If your printer is connected to the internet, it has its own unique address. If you just bought a Wi-Fi enabled refrigerator, it's got its own internet access. And so with the internet of things, with all these individual devices, smartwatches, tablets, all of those require a unique address. You know, we were quickly running out of available addresses. And so they had to come up with a, a new standard, which is the IP uh, version six. And it has 128 bits. And so you look at it and say, oh, well, that's got four times as many bits. It doesn't have four times as many possible combinations. It is much, much more than that. So the actual number with 128 bits that you can get possible combinations is that. That is a big number. And so hopefully that will last us for a long time into the future and of course the challenge with going with the 128 bits is that the numeric address that I showed you up there the 209.152 instead of being 11 numbers it's now going to be 44 numbers but it gives us so many more addresses so we should be fine for a long long time we talk about the World Wide Web, and a lot of people use World Wide Web and Internet as interchangeable. They actually aren't. Originally, the designers didn't know how things were going to shape out and go out, and so they kind of created this thing they called the World Wide Web that was going to interconnect these different things. Email was certainly a big one. FTP, which is File Transfer Protocol. And, you know, they had all these different things. So if you look at an address, a lot of times you'll see that it starts with HTTP colon slash slash www. That's telling it that on the World Wide Web, it was a hypertext transport protocol, and that's the way it was structured. If you were going to an FTP site, and the idea there was that they were going to optimize FTP sites for transferring large data files, whereas the hypertext protocol sites used for websites and email those didn't have to be optimized for the high data rate because it was basically just text data when it started. When the internet first started, they didn't know about things like graphic images on websites and so forth. And so they created this structure. Now anymore, we use the terms, like I say, interchangeably, and oftentimes you go up to the website 
you can type in your address bar. You don't have to type in the HTTP or the www if you just type in the uh, internet name that you want to go to uh, it doesn't need the rest of it the that name is called a universal resource locator and so we'll take a look now at what the URL what the construction of on the full name of that is so in this example as I mentioned HTTP at the beginning says it's a hypertext transport protocol the www is telling you know what uh, file trans you know what what type of site is it in this case a World Wide Web this is the name and this is kind of ironic it starts from lowest and goes to highest so it starts with the specific device that you're talking about so it's a it's a computer in the business department it's located in the organization Auburn University and the EDU tells it that this is a educational uh, you know organization There is no real policing on what you call an EDU or a .com or there's a number of other uh, top level domain endings that can be on there. You can create a site using any of those endings. It just uh, people have come to expect that if it's a .edu, it's an educational institution. You know, nonprofits, they're expecting to see a .org. If it's a for-profit business, you're expecting to see a .com and so forth. But there is no regulations per se that say you have to use that. I would encourage you, though, if you do create and reserve a domain name, that you follow the general protocols because it can be confusing to people if you're using a different top level domain uh, than is appropriate for your business. So as we mentioned last week with one terabyte of data being cr created every or not one terabyte excuse me uh, one zettabyte of data. It's so much stuff. How do you find the information you're looking for? And so early on in the days of the internet, this idea of a search engine was developed to assist in the process of finding what you're looking for because on the internet, we don't know where to look. The information we might want could be located anywhere. So how do you find it? So the largest search engines, and this is as of September 2017, I haven't seen the 2018 numbers released yet. Google is the big player. Clearly in the U.S. they are dominant with 86% market share. Bing is Microsoft's attempt. They would like to chip away at that. They haven't been very successful. And Yahoo, which was at one time a leader in the search engines has dropped down to just a measly 6%. But when we get outside of the US, the, those numbers change. And in particular, if we take a look at China, you can see that Google China is down at the bottom with only 5.6%. And the big player in China is a company called Baidu. Now part of that uh, Baidu is a Chinese company and China has put some restrictions on Google and other things have really prevented it from getting much of a, a foothold in China. That's maybe changing a little bit going forward that they're loosening up a little bit and Google has acquiesced to some of their requirements. China wants to be much more involved in censorship and filtering what people see. If we go to our filter bubble, 
you know, if you think Google is filter bubbling us here in the U.S., you, that's nothing compared to what the government does with Baidu in China. A meta search engine is the idea that each of the search engines that are out there in the U.S. besides Bing, Yahoo, and Google, there are other search engines that you can utilize. And each search engine has a different way of organizing the data that they find out on the internet. And so if you do the same search with different search engines, you will get slightly different results. The concept of a meta search engine is I give one request to the meta search engine and then it goes out and it contacts each of the other search engines and comes up with a combined list that is returned to me. So instead of me having to go and individually search on each of through each of these different search engines, the meta search engine will do that work for me and come up with a condensed compiled list of all the different search engines that they have a relationship with. Another term you'll hear talked about are portals. And a portal is just a way of grouping together information, sites that are relevant to a particular group of people. So it's, it's already focused and pulled in the type of information that this particular group of people would be interested in looking at. So you can have a commercial portal where everybody can access to it, but you know thematically what their portal is focusing on. And this is actually the probably most uh, the popular portal you'll see on the internet are these public portals. Affinity portals, these are really targeted and they will be or organized around hobbies, political parties, specific causes. Another one is mobile portals, and these are ones that are optimized specifically to be accessible for mobile devices. Corporate portals are you know, focused on specific companies, and then you can have an industry portal that is organized around a particular industry, say the energy industry. So you go to that portal and it's got everything you want to know about energy. So here's a portal that you should all be familiar with, mypcc.edu, because it has pulled together all the information for you as a student, some of which is contained within PCC, some of it is linking to external uh, websites or companies like Gmail and like Desire to Learn. Here's an example of an industry portable. This happens to be for a trucking enthusiast. And so it's got here, it's pulled together, it's got information, articles, galleries, forums, and it's all focused around truck trucking. With communication, we're all familiar with email. We're unfortunately, most of us are familiar with web-based call centers that are oftentimes located outside of the U.S. And, uh, you know, sometimes I've had to tell the person I'm talking to, I'm sorry, but I can't understand you. Your accent is too heavy. I will call back and hope that I get someone else. I really appreciate it when the companies I call and they have their call center is utilizing people whose 
first language is English, so they have excellent English skills. That makes it much easier. And of course, electronic chat room, everybody's familiar with that. The one thing I wanted to point out when you hear VOIP, that's Voice Over Internet Protocol. Virtually, well, I will say it, tell you, all phone calls today are VOIP, whether you're calling from your business phone or your cell phone, they get digitized and communicated across internet protocol transmissions within the phone companies. That's how voice calls are handled today. Now, even if your phone system at work, if you think you've got an analog phone system, it really goes from that phone and very quickly it goes to a box that converts it to digital and transmits it using the internet protocol. So virtually all phone communications today are VOIP. And of course video YouTube is a huge way of communicating information. As I mentioned before, it just amazes me how many topics are available on YouTube uh, especially when it comes to technology if you want to know gee how do I format a word document to do this just search on, on YouTube there'll be someone there explaining it to you it's amazing people have a lot of free time they create these videos some of them not so good but a lot of them really very helpful collaboration or work group software was developed as we started to have these globally dispersed teams working together on projects. We needed a way of dynamically interfacing, editing the same document at the same time instead of having to send stuff back and forth was just taking too long. And so this uh, collaborative software was developed. Some of the common ones that you will see is Microsoft SharePoint, uh, Google Docs, certainly is one that's used a lot. Crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing really I'd say has taken off in the you know, the last 10 years as we have become a more interconnected society on a, and even on a global basis where you have someone who has a need. I need some help doing this. I need some financial backing to help me finish this. They have a need and so put put out the word and see is there anyone. What you'll find is that you have a bunch of people say hey I've got some free time or hey I've got a little bit of extra cash and so it has been a way that instead of having to go out and find mega sourcing if you have a bunch of individuals who do a little bit said hey I could work on this for you for a few hours this week and you get a hundred people that can each say hey I can put in a couple hours all of a sudden you have 200 hours of help getting your project done one of the first ones to get involved in this company called Kickstarter now unfortunately crowdsourcing developed without anyone in government having any idea that it might develop. And as I've mentioned in class several times, the government legislation has been very slow to catch up with what's going on in technology. There is no real policing of crowdsourcing things. And so just because someone opens up Oh, this poor person, they had, you know, their, their house burned down, the family is displaced, and we've opened up, you know, a fund here so that, you know, if we can all chip in a little bit, there's no one authenticating and saying, this is truly a need. This really happened to a family, and there's nothing pol policing them to say that that money will actually go to that person and be used for that. So if you want to contribute to Kickstarter, either with your time or with your money or any of the other crowdsourcing websites, 
do your homework and make sure it's a legitimate organization, a legitimate need, because there's been a lot of fraud. People saying they had this urgent need when they really didn't. So now to something more interesting, telepresence systems. And the idea of telepresence, it goes beyond video conferencing. It's where you actually create the illusion that someone is there in the room. Now, the picture from the textbook here, when we're looking at it, the people are sitting here and what's not really easy to see is that the table up front here is cut in half and the screen takes and picks up from there. And so it creates this illusion that these people are sitting on the other side of the table and they're not. They're at a remote location that is a video display. And so you can create this virtual environment where people are able to interact and see the other half of the room as if it really is there when it is thousands of miles away in another country, time zone, whatever. We'll actually watch a video in class that demonstrates the kind of the next generation of this to where it, it can be much more mobile than this, than a fixed location like this in a conference room. And the reason there's been so much work going on in this with telepresence, and as I showed you, I believe I'm on the second week of class, that, uh, you know, we're, as human beings, we're social creatures. We like seeing people. We like being in the same room with them. And to the extent that telepresence can give us a near you know, a simulated experience like that. It allows us to have that engagement and interaction without the cost of flying a bunch of people halfway around the world. So it is enhanced business communications for a fraction of the cost. So there you have it, Chapter 6 Networks. As I mentioned, we have some interesting videos I'll show you in class and some discussions. See you in class.